right, good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you all here at church today. <clears throat> Please open your Bible to the book of Luke, chapter 19, uh, verse, uh, verses 11 through 28. Right. Uh, let me finish this the reading today. Let, let's let's start together, and then I'll finish at the end. The, the reason why is because, as you know, after we read the scripture, I always say the very word of God, and everybody says Amen. And you know, usually uh, it ends on something nice and bright. You know. Um, you know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And who should ever believe in him should have everlasting life. The very word of God. Amen. Very bright and, and nice. But if you look at the last verse of our scripture today, it's going to be difficult to say amen. But uh, it's the word of Jesus Christ. So uh, I'll finish it and then, uh, yeah, let's say amen at the end of it, okay? But please join me from the beginning. Let's read together from verse 11. Uh, through 21, and then I'll finish at verse 20, from verse 22 to 28. So, let's read together from verse 11. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. Let me continue. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow, why then, did you put my, why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back I could have collected it with interest? And then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they replied, he already has ten. And he replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. And after this, Jesus, uh, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. The very words of God. Amen. Yeah. If you'll forgive me, I'll just talk about myself for 
two minutes. At the age of uh, 15, I was converted to discipleship with Jesus Christ. And at the age of 17, I was called to serve God through ministry to young people. I felt that God had told me, Chris, I want you to be a minister for teenagers, junior high schools, junior high schoolers and high schoolers, maybe college students. And I said, okay, great. Let me go to a seminary or Bible school. Let me learn how to study the word of God and to preach, and then let me become a youth pastor, is what they're called. And while I was in Bible school, God said, I felt, Chris, you need to repay your student loan, and, there, you, and I want you to go abroad. I want you to go to a country with few Christians, a country where they need to hear the gospel. So I said, okay. So I checked out Korea, and there's too many Christians in Korea. So uh, a, a job in Japan opened. And uh, I came to Japan, and I started teaching English to people like Mila, uh, not junior high schoolers, not high schoolers, um, <laughs> just a lot of office ladies and some uh, uh, just, just shakaiji people in general. And I thought, Lord, I, I thought I was supposed to be a youth pastor, a youth minister, working with junior hires and high schoolers. And I thought, well, I, I guess I had the wrong hope. After five years at um, English school, I, I got a new job working at a vocational school. In Japanese, it's called Senmongakko. And uh, it's working with college students, young adults. So getting closer to high school and junior high school for five years there. And then after five years at vocational school, I got a job at a junior high school and high school, a Jesuit Catholic uh, boys junior high high school. And I've been working there uh, for 10 years now. And while I'm there, I teach uh, Bible to both junior high and high school students. I have a Bible class now on Wednesdays to 7th, 8th, and 10th graders. Chuichi Chuni and Koichi. I say all of that to say this. My hope was to teach the Bible to young people. I did not expect to do it in Japanese. Right? God put a hope and a vision in my heart and in my mind. He said, you will be a minister to young people. And me, in my young, foolish, narrow-minded thought and thinking, I thought it was to young American people. <laughs> but God's ways are higher than our ways. Amen? Amen. And after 15 years, he, he went around my vision, and he brought me around to his will. I want to ask you, did God put a hope in your heart? What is your vision and hope for God's will in your life? Now, I want you to make the distinction between hope 
and expectation. They are two different things. Kibo and Kitai. Hope and expectation. The Bible says three things are important. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Hope is what God inspires and instills in your heart through the gospel. When Jesus Christ enters into your life, you are a new creation. The old is gone and new has come. And your heart and your mind is transformed and conformed into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. You're thinking like Jesus. You're, you're seeing like Jesus. And your heart is, is feeling like Jesus. And you want to be like Jesus. And you're filled with hope, a hope of glory and a hope of, of, of something that, of joy. That's hope. However, there's an expectation. Oh, God! Salvation? Heaven? The kingdom? I see. That's my hope. And this is how you are going to do it. You're going to let me do this, which will lead to that. And this is how the hope will be fulfilled. This is how the hope is, the vision is accomplished. And God says, no, 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 no. Be careful. That's expectation. It's not hope. All right, so that was the introduction. Why, why are we talking about this with, with this scripture? Please look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. Yuki, you got it? All right. Verse 11. Yuki, Mark, please put uh, verse 11. While they were listening to this, they, they is the disciples. He's at a party at Zacchaeus' house. And, and Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Okay? That's verse 10. It's actually in your bulletin on the opposite side. It's a very big print. So Jesus is preaching in the house at the party. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. This is the mission of the gospel. This is the mission of Luke, actually. Central, central verse. So, so, okay, back to verse 11. While they were listening to this, he, Jesus, went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And the people thought, let's change that word, the people expected that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. Are you with me? Oh, Jesus, we're seven miles from Jerusalem. For three years, we've been following you. You've been healing. You've been opening the eyes of the blind. You've been uh, feeding the 5,000. You've been walking on water. Oh, you're God. And Jesus, we've been watching you, raising the dead. You've been teaching on mountains and on hills. You've been preaching. Thousands of people are following you. You are the king. You are the Messiah. You are going to go to Jerusalem, overthrow Herod. You're going to overthrow Rome. And finally, the Jewish people, the Messiah's, God's kingdom is going to come. When? At once. Next week? In a couple of days? We're close. We're getting there, Jesus you're about to go into Jerusalem, put on that crown and show your glory, put the hammer down on the oppressor and set your people free. Jesus, let's go. Going to happen at once. That's their hope. Their hope is the kingdom of God. Their expectation is at once. And so Jesus tells this story. Right? I don't need to go over the story again. I just want to tell you a very interesting part of this story. It's the story behind the story. I love this story. It's great. Archelaus was the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the king at Christmas time. 
He was the one that tried to kill Jesus. He had three sons, and at his death, he wanted to, he wanted to divide the kingdom amongst his sons. One of them was Archelaus. The problem was, they're under the power of Rome. If you are the king, you cannot become king without the permission of Rome. So Herod the Great, he's going to die. He wants to give Archelaus half of his kingdom. And part of it is actually where they're at now. It's called Jericho. The problem with Archelaus is he is a tyrant. He's a party boy. He's greedy. He's extravagant. He's kind of lazy, too. And he's very arrogant and proud. And uh, the people did not want him to be king. They rejected him. It's interesting. There's a country in the world now who, that just had a new leader that was elected. And the people, half of the people don't want him. And the other half, they welcome him. And the one who's leading the country now, he's proud and arrogant, and he's a party guy. And he reminds me a lot of Archelaus. So Archelaus, he's, he's saying, I'm the king, I'm the king, make me the king, I'm your king. And the people say, well, you're not our king, you're not my king. And so he goes, okay, I'm going to go to Caesar, I'm going to Rome. And I'm going to ask him to make me the king. So he takes his family, he takes his mom, he takes his sisters, they go to Rome. Big, big journey, big, big people. And while he's at Rome, there's a big meeting of about 10,000 people in this large stadium. And he's making his appeal to the emperor, Caesar. While he's there, about 50 other people from Jerusalem and Palestine and Samaria, they go also to Rome, and they say, this Archelaus, he's lazy, he's arrogant, he's tyrannical, he's terrible, don't make him king. Caesar, if you love your country, don't make this man. So Caesar, he says, all right, all right, I've heard everything, give me a couple of days. So Caesar goes back. He thinks about it, and this is his decision. I'm going to give Archelaus a trial period. Archelaus, you will not be rexus. You will not be king. You will be ethnarch. Ethnarch means you will be a kind of governor. And after a period of time, if you prove worthy, then I will give you the title of king. Otherwise... No, thank you. So Archelaus comes back from Rome, not as a king, but as the governor. And he never had the chance to become king because he failed miserably in his governance of the people. This happened when Jesus was still a young boy, maybe about three years old. Okay? So now it's 30 years later. And Jesus is telling this parable. There was a young man born from noble birth. He goes off to a foreign country to have himself appointed king. Right? And so the people listening are thinking, ha ha, Archelaus. And then to return. And then this is where Jesus flips the story. He called 10 of his servants, gave them 10 minas, put, it, put this money to work, he said, until I come back. Let's go to the next slide. And, but his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him. We don't want this man to be our king. However, he was made king. This is Jesus' story. Archelaus was the false king who failed at his job. He went off to a foreign country to be crowned king 
but didn't make it. Jesus is the true king. And he went off to be crowned king. And he is going to return and finish his job. That's what this parable is talking about. But as he, Jesus comes back, he wants his disciples to understand something. His disciples have the wrong expectation. They have the right hope. Jesus, you're going to be our king soon. And Jesus says, pump the brakes. Chotto matte, chotto matte. Yeah, I'm going to be king. But you need to change your expectation. You have the right hope, the wrong expectation. Lord, help me preach this. You want the kingdom to come, and the kingdom will come. But you have to understand that it comes at a price. People don't want me to be king. They don't want me to be king so bad, they're willing to kill me. So that's what they're going to do. But they don't know that be, but as they kill me, that's how they crown me. I'm going to put on a crown, but it's a crown of thorns. I'm going to have a robe, but it's going to be a false robe. And I'm going to be put on a throne, but that throne is going to be a cross. And three days later, after they bear me, that is when I will be declared the king. I'm going away. And you need to understand, because here's what's going to happen. When I'm away, I have something for you to do. When I'm gone, there is work for you that I have. I've prepared for you. So here's some work for you. Here's some work for you. Here's some work for you. Now, when you're reading this, maybe you're thinking, ah, ha, 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 Pastor Chris is going to talk about gospel responsibility. This is like the parable of the talents. I have to use my talents, the mina he's given me, and I have to work it, and I have to fulfill my duty to Jesus to multiply what he's given me, and that's how uh, he's going to give me my reward. Yeah, that's, that's there. That's there. But please understand, Jesus, there's, there's a work he has for us that is yet to come because of who he is. Uh, what are you talking about? Okay. So he gives these ten servants one mina each. A mina is 100 days worth of wages. So you work 100 days, three months and a few weeks, you have one mina. It's a lot of money. And he gives the equal amount to each person. He says, put this to work. Does he say, you go to work? He says, put this to work. This mina will do the work. So, he comes back. There's the two, right? One, one servant says, I've multiplied it 1,000 times. Here's 10 minas back. And the other one says, I've multiplied it 500 times. Right? One mina becomes five. Here's it back. And then the other mina stays one mina. Okay. You will not be able to see the hope fulfilled. You will not see the vision come true until you understand how Jesus works. How Jesus fulfills his hope. Jesus is not the God who will say, come on, come on, get to work. Let's go, let's go. 
You're lazy. You're sitting there. You're not doing anything. Come on. Get to work. What, are you, you say you're a Christian. You call yourself a believer, but you're not showing me anything. That's not Jesus. Because the mina is the one doing the work. The servant is just putting it to work. So, let me just tell a different story. This is going to be interesting, I hope. Um, I was in college, and I started working at um, an Italian restaurant, kind of a fancy restaurant. And my first day on the job, my boss comes. I, some of you know the story. My boss comes, and he says, okay, Chris, I'm going to give you a wine tasting. He puts me down at the table. He gets about five or six, I can't remember, it's been so long, five or six different wines off of the cellar shelf or wall. Opens each bottle of wine. Chianti, Riesling, Chardonnay, uh, and Merlot, right? Low-level wine. And he opens each bottle, and he says, Chris, I want you to taste each wine. I'm like, this is cool. That's a good thing I didn't drive today. And I'm tasting the wine. He says, you see how you, can you, can you taste the sharpness? Can you taste the, the flavor? You see, this one is different. It's a little bit sweeter because of this country or this grape. And this one, it goes well with beef. It goes well with this pasta you pair it with. And then this one, you don't, you don't pair it with this. You use it with a fish or a white sauce or a white meat. And this is the good one. When you, you can start people with the low-level wine, but then as they start drinking more, you can start upselling and, and recommending a higher... You see what he's doing? He's teaching me. And he says, Chris, this job is going to be fun. You're going to work for tips. And people are going to enjoy drinking your, the wine that you recommend and the, and the way that you talk to them and the way that you can, you know recommend these great wines. But listen to me, Chris. Let's make something very clear. I am a businessman. I'm here to make money. You're going to enjoy doing the work of selling these wines and being a good waiter. But let's make this clear. I'm a businessman. I want you to take care of business. That's what you're here for. God is in the business of saving the lost. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. I'm in business, and I want you to take care of my business. I'm giving you a hope, and it's not your expectation I'm caring about. It's my expectation. You see that? Until we realize, no, no, excuse me, until we re-examine how Christ is doing his work, we'll not see the hope being fulfilled. Now, how does this work? How, how is it that one guy made ten minas, another guy made five, and another one didn't? I just want you to realize something. I'm going to close soon. Um, there's a part of this parable that no one teaches and I, I, I feel it's unfortunate and I'm not trying to give you some new or wild teaching. I'm trying to give you the teaching of the scripture. This scripture right here is the story of the entire Bible. This story shows us the reason why we are made in the image of God. This story right here shows us the kind of God who made us. How? Let me show you. We are given the image of God because God says, I want you to rule and reign over this creation. I've made the, the mountains, the valleys, I've put the fish in the water, I've put the 
excuse me, I get excited. I put the birds in the air, I put the animals on the ground. I want you to work and move and manage and be responsible for my creation. I've given you my image. I've given you my title. I've given you my authority as the image bearer of God. That was in the very beginning. And so we sin and we fall short and we, we, we lose our authority. We mismanage our power. And then Jesus comes. And Jesus says, I'm here to give it back. I'm here to give you what you've lost. And I want you to know something. I, I, this thing is in my way. Can I get out of the... Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I just... I can't. All right, I'm sorry. I'm going to give you my, my COVID. So everybody's got a mask on, so that's good. So, so here's something about God. I, I really hope this goes into your heart because this really transforms me the way I think. God is not a God who gets power to have power. God is a God who gives power. He gives it away. That's the gospel. The gospel is the most powerful, the most authoritative, the most uh, righteous God wants to give authority. He divides, he delegates power. Um, there was a speech given recently. And the man who gave the speech said this. I, I'm going to be a leader and I don't want to, I don't want to lead by the example of my power, I want to lead by the power of my example. Okay? So here's what he's saying. He's saying, I have power. I'm the leader. But I don't want to use you to make me feel stronger. I'm not going to use people to get power for myself. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use my power to make people stronger. Okay? That's the power of the example. I want to give my authority, my power, my, my, my abilities so that you are able to get stronger. You are able to go, to go bigger. You are able to expand your authority. You've been responsible with 10 minas. Excuse me, with one mina. Here's 10 cities. You made five minas out of this. Here's five cities. I mean, just a little bit of money and God gives cities? I mean, it's just 10 minas. It's a few years of work, and you want to give out an entire <laughs> district? That's how generous God is. God is giving. God is re releasing authority and power. And, and that's the story of this. Our hope as Christians, our belief as followers of Christ, is, is not to rule and reign in some powerful way, but to to serve and give the way God served and gave to us. That's this parable. So how is that working? How does the mina work by itself? Because look what it says. He says, uh, verse 16, first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned 10 more, right? It doesn't say, I earned 10 more. It says, your mina did the work itself. It's a, there's an attitude. Go to the next slide. Um, the second, verse 18, the second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. How is it that the mina earns? Okay, here, you're going to love this story. Okay, this is awesome. This happened today. I'm sitting in church today at the morning service. The service finishes. The lady sitting next to me, um, we're old friends. Uh, we've been going to this church together for decades. She says, there's a baptism on Christmas. There's going to be two baptisms. Please come. Japanese service. I said, wow. One of the women, her son was your student. I said, what? Do you remember, uh, you, you had a student named, I, can't, I don't want to say his name, but you had a student, and you had a Bible class with that student. And this was back maybe, I'd say, eight years ago. I was a rookie teacher. I had one Bible student, or one Bible class with one student. I had terrible Japanese. And every week I'm like, God, 
I have this one Bible student, I can't speak Japanese, what do I do? And I have this like, I would say, shogaku ichi nensei level, Japanese, first, first grade level Japanese. And I just want to give the gospel, I want to talk about God. And I'm failing miserably. However, this student keeps coming. This student has a, had a younger sister who had Down syndrome. He was struggling. God, why did you give me a sister with a, a terrible disease? And for some reason, he kept listening to me, and I'm talking about that, and it kind of helped him. His mother went to Hiroshima University to a doctor who specializes in Down syndrome. That teacher, that professor, is a Christian. He also had another patient whose son had Down syndrome. That patient is a member of this church. It gets better. So he recommends to my, it's going to be complicated, he, he recommends to my student's mother, there's a church called Mitaki. There's a woman there who has a Down syndrome son. Go and meet them. The mother comes to Mitaki. She hears about the gospel choir. She joins the gospel choir. She brings her Down syndrome daughter, the little sister of my student. She comes to church on and off, on and off, for about 10 years, just for Christmas and for Easter, just little things. And she brings little, her little daughter, beautiful girl. So she hasn't been coming in a while, but recently, the, the, the director of our gospel choir, Mariko Horikawa, she's been reaching out to her, and she's, she's been listening to the, the sermons online, and she's been uh, studying the Bible with uh, Mariko Sensei, and she comes to believe the gospel. She comes to receive Jesus Christ. And she's talking to the lady sitting next to me, she's saying, yeah, Chris Sensei, he really helped. And I'm not trying to boast or anything like that. I, I had no idea. I was just trying to share the love of Jesus. Okay. She's saying, oh, yeah, my son was comforted by Pastor Chris's words way back then. And now he's a medical student and he's really happy. And now I found Jesus and I want to get baptized. Hallelujah. I don't, I don't know how you feel about your mission and your work. You've been given a mina, okay? Your mina is the gospel, the love of God, who came to seek and save the lost. That's your mina. And maybe you think, I don't... Uh, what am I doing? I can't even speak the language. I have no friends, or I, 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 don't, I don't know how to do it. Yeah, you don't know how. You have a hope, right? And maybe you're making mistakes, you're stumbling, or maybe you feel, I don't even know what's happening. Listen, let the mina do the work. Let the gospel, just do the gospel. Love Jesus. Serve God. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. Right? Love mercy. Do justly. Walk humbly with your God. This is it. I'm done in one minute. Thomas Aquinas, the great Christian theologian, way back in 1200, he said, there's three things that man loves. It doesn't matter if you're Christian or not. Three things that all humans desire. Beauty, Truth and goodness. Beauty, truth, and goodness. Jesus Christ came. He is the beauty. He is the truth. He is God. He is goodness personified. All right? What is your job? You can't preach. You don't have all the answers to the Bible. You know just a little bit of the Bible. You know what you have? You have beauty, truth, and goodness. You go to your work. You go to your school. You go to your place where you live. You go to your neighbors. You make that neighborhood beautiful. You make that school beautiful. Literally, 
decorate it, okay? You make the system work better, goodness, right? You make your office better, and you live out the truth that you have from Jesus Christ. Let the mina do the work, okay? And when Jesus comes on that great and glorious day, you will stand before your king, right? And it's not that you are, are good and faithful. Yes, you are, because he is good and he is faithful. He finished the job. When he was on the cross, he finished the job that we failed to do. Therefore, in him, we will be faithful. Come on now. He will be faithful. So go. And you don't, if you have a chance to preach, preach. If you have a chance to speak Jesus, say Jesus. If you don't, give goodness, beauty, and truth. And the minor will, will work. The minor will be multiplied. Amen? Amen? All right, let's go ahead and pray. So, Heavenly Father, we, we want to humble ourselves before you. We, we don't want to be arrogant or proud or ambitious with selfishness. We just want to be faithful servants to, to, to do the work that you have for us to do. We love you, and we just want to share your love with others. Please help us. Give us the strength. We'll do this in Jesus' name. Amen.